Hi, everyone. So uh, welcome to SteelCon. And for those of you watching at home or online or whatever, um, welcome. Uh, I'm uh, Ian Thornton Trump, and it's my delight to have as adult supervision uh, Philip Ingram, who um, I kind of brought into this topic because he has some really unique uh, perspectives and experiences to share as, as well as my own. Uh, we're going to put the bios up there. Um, these are our sort of bios that, you know, get thrown out every time we, we do a public, uh, type of event like this. Um, but, uh, you can kind of read those. And then, um, Phil's got some words of wisdom that he wants to share with you, like right off the bat. So, Phil? And cheers. Um, and thank you for allowing me to come to SteelCon. Uh, my bio up there says, says most of it. Uh, but I was a British military intelligence officer. Um, for uh, about 26 years um, in operations all over the world. And the title um, will probably shock a few people because coming into the center of academia and talking about killing people is not something that you'd normally do. Um, having spent a long career in the military, I want to turn around and say that most people in the military are pacifists. And people won't believe that. But there's two types of pacifism. Um, one where you will protest um, and uh, suggest that people should sit down and negotiate, uh, and that's your approach to peace. The other, where you fight for peace. A little story that uh, puts into context why I thought fighting for peace was right. In a particular operational theater, there was an intercept of um, a communications between two commanders on the opposing side, and they were discussing what they were going to do in a village. And the question from one commander to the other was, um, we've captured the village, what are we going to do with the women and children? The message came back from the other commander, you know what to do. The message came back again saying, no, we've captured it, they're no threat. The message came back from his boss saying, you know what to do, if you don't do it, we'll sort your family out. They were going to kill everyone in that village. At that moment in time, the moral dilemma of whether it was right to take human life or not disappeared completely. I visited that village after those two commanders had disappeared off this planet um, on orders from me. Um, and I went to that village and I saw the women and children coming out of the rubble of the houses that they've been living in. And I sat down and I talked to them and I saw the smiles in the faces of the children as peace was being brought into that particular area. Um, that is something that was very personal and gives you that personal dilemma. But um, we were fighting for peace because as a human race, um, there are bad people around and a lot of them don't respect the fact that uh, the right to protest and sh we should sit down and, 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 and discuss things. The, the other bit is when it comes to question time, nothing's off limits. You, know, you can ask me any question that you want. I'll give you as detailed an answer as I can. If I go into too much detail, I'm afraid I'm going to have to shred a few of you before you leave. But hey, that's just the nature of the business. Ian. Yeah, I guess some collateral damage. Um, thanks, Phil, because I, I, even though I sort of do this topic tongue in cheek and I've put some interesting tweets out to kind of hype the talk a little bit, uh, you're absolutely right that there's a dimension to this that, um, is, I think, going to be a bit uncomfortable, especially when we look at, uh, some of the things that have trans transpired. Um, we're going to set the scene right now because um, those of you that haven't experienced um, conflict, uh, I'm going to talk somewhat granularly, um, may not understand sort of the contemporary battle space. You know, we see the pictures over and over on documentaries in uh, from World War II and v Vietnam and more recently in Iraq and Afghanistan. But I think it's important to realize that this is very much a difficult and messy business. Um, and it, that was incredibly complicated by the contemporary theater of operations in the Ukraine, where the actual battle for the Ukraine started in 2014 with their first invasion by the Russians. And so one of the things that now that it's headlines and we see the news and all of the terrible things that have been going on, those terrible things had been going on for quite some time until Russia decided to become even more aggressive and move in what they were calling their special military operation um, and attack the larger part of the Ukraine. Um, I think it's fair to say that we didn't really have um, the dimensions um, before the contemporary era with cyber and space 
Um, they were peripheral players in most of the major land battles that we've had up until more recently when we've been, been involved in um, counterterrorism and counterinsurgency operations in the post 9-11 era. So up there is a slide where you have a number of people back in the 2000s, early times, uh, where the United States government and allies, including um, Canada and uh, the UK and many other co countries, entered the Afghanistan theater and the Iraq theaters um, and found themselves in the midst of an entirely new but not completely unknown um, battle space, which was insurgency and counterinsurgency. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, talk, talk about Afghanistan and, and um, Iraq. You know, bottom line, you know, Afghanistan and Iraq were disasters. We should never have got involved in Iraq in the first place. And Afghanistan, when we went into it, uh, first of all, um, after 9-11, for the first two years, the mission was credible because it was to remove it as a space for al-Qaeda to um, develop and train and deploy um, terrorist uh, terrorists overseas. But then Iraq came along and uh, you, the US and UK governments split their main effort. Militarily, you never split your main effort. Um, and that then became a disaster. And Afghanistan then bumbled along and changed its mission and adapted things. And we completely and utterly destroyed the place and destroyed any chance of um, getting peace there. Um, and we're right royally kicked out. Um, I'd, I, I want to expand on a little bit what, about what you said um, going back to Ukraine. Ukraine, the first invasion was 2014. Putin started a lot earlier than that in his ambitions to get Ukraine. He started in 2003. And this is another domain that we haven't got up there, but is a very important domain uh, and is affecting all of us on a daily basis. And it's the information domain. He started in 2003, bringing out his information operations, talking in a number of speeches from then up to the 2014 invasion of Crimea um, and backing the separatists in the disputed Donbass region, um, he started uh, calling the Ukrainians little Russians. He did that for two reasons. One, to demean them, but two, to try and suggest that they didn't deserve a national identity. We're seeing that coming out in what, what they're saying today, um, but also to set the conditions uh, within Russia that um, they wanted to get Ukraine back in again. And that um, information operation continued um, the whole way through um, up until the invasion and continues today. Information is an area that affects all of us on a daily basis in everything that we do. And it's made worse by that because we all carry, there I've just, uh, just switched the torch on, we all, we all carry the ability to um, get information uh, in a way that our brains can't con um, process it fast enough um, and send information out to global leaders. We used to be, and I'm talking about UK, US, allies and all the rest of it, very, very good at it during the Second World War, Operation Fortitude, convincing Hitler that we were going in through the Pas de Calais and not um, going in, uh, in through Normandy, um, the complexity of that. Um, but it's nothing new. Fake news is nothing new. Sun Tzu, the great 6th century Chinese philosopher and general, turned around and said, um, all deception is warfare, all warfare is deception. Deception, fake news, uh, misinformation, disinformation. It is the big player in everything that we're doing. Ian? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with with that analysis, and and especially when you look at the 19th century of the Ukraine, um, it was invaded and occupied on numerous occasions, and it's been a place of co of of near constant conflict over the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, Occasionally, a news article will come out which infuriates me, and the latest one was when there was some British rhetoric and U.S. rhetoric about the idea that they would respond with kinetic force to a hack attack. Um, they actually maybe forgot that they had already done this uh, when a well-known, um, uh, I would say, cyber protagonist who started with Team Poison um, and attacking the Sony network uh, went full jihad and started doing the online recruitment for a group called ISIS, which they're not nice people. I think they fall firmly in the category of nice, of not nice people. Um, he was eliminated. Yeah, I've, I've got, I've got, I've got a friend who's ex Al Qaeda and, and he is a friend. He was Al Qaeda for 10 years. Um, and uh, I, I meet him for lunch and coffee, but well, he doesn't drink coffee. He drinks Diet Coke, um, uh, fairly, fairly frequently, but I don't think he'll ever have friends from ISIS. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 he was eliminated in, in a targeted drone strike. Um, and for his, 
primarily for his activity, not the Sony hack. I want to underline that. But um, primarily because of his online recruiting capabilities of trying to bring uh, people into ISIS. Um, and so, you know, when nations are compelled to strike, um, the, this is the type of decision that is agonized and goes through councils and goes through a great deal of decision making. It's not something that countries take lightly, but when they feel that there's an imminent threat to our society, uh, then a decision like that is, is called upon. Now, I kind of try to contextualize this by providing what is called a big data um, relationship to that counterterrorism mission. And it looks a lot like this, which is a giant hairball of relationships. And in fact, in this particular picture, this is 5,000 Facebook friends from a, a educational institution looking for drug traffickers amongst them with various data sources. Now, to make it a little bit more easy to understand, this is what an insurgent cell looks like. And as you can see, there's nodes that are in control, and then there's the commanders issuing their orders to those particular nodes. And if you wanted, for instance, to eliminate the capabilities of an organization and the logistics train, it would take an enormous amount of effort to reduce one of those hairballs entirely. It is easier to decapitate the snake than it is to kill all of the snakes that exist in that layer. And so what you're looking at is created with I2, um, Palantir, and um, I believe it's also called Multigo, which we use in cyber quite a bit, are all capable of analyzing massive amounts of data samples. And this was phone data from insurgents that were in communication with each other. And maybe, uh, Phil, do you want to sort of walk through what happens when, you know, the int guys roll in with something like this? Yeah, you've, you've got it sitting in there, and you've got um, a, a finite number of areas that you can target to create the effect. Everything is about the effect, so you want to try and stop what's going on. Um, it's very easy to stop the people on the ground at times when you know where they are who are going to go and carry out the attack, the two that we've got up there in the box. Uh, but once you take them out, um, almost certainly they're going to be replaced because there's lots more people who are foot soldiers who can come forward and do it. Uh, and you can keep taking the foot soldiers out and keep taking the foot soldiers out, but you're not going to have an effect in stopping what it is that's going on. So you sit and look at the nodes and you go, aha, there's a blob in the center there. And you look where everyone else is feeding into, and that blob is uh, the one that's sending the, uh, the instructions out. Um, uh, and uh, you try and identify who that is, and they then become onto a high-value target list or a high-priority target list or both and you hit the center of that node because it's very difficult then for the organizations to replicate that central node of someone in that command and control position who's controlling the foot soldiers on the ground, who's making sure things that, that go on, and you're continuously looking out for those. So that, from uh, an intelligence perspective, is gold dust. Exactly. Now, a lot of you might be thinking that what we're going to talk about is like highly classified military stuff, but this guy changed the game for us completely as capabilities were revealed that were absolutely out of this world, that really the world had no idea. Um, and even folks within the military, um, when the uh, number of and gigantic amount of money that was being spent on secret NSA programs that Snowden revealed. I put up a number of other uh, books there that go into quite exquisite detail on some of the operations that were run uh, during Iraq, um, which those operations lead us to believe that they've been improved on and enhanced um, in coordination with the Ukraine. And I'm talking about the use of malware, the use of, as, um, as uh, Phil pointed out, uh, phone tracking data and other things that were all developed around that particular time. Um, so we get into the era of spying um, and spies that are spying on each other, and it became less about, you know, building a network of humans and more about getting access to devices and classified materials. And I think what was 
really kind of interesting is the revelations of the Snowden documents, which this stuff is a, a sample from, talked about a very rapid ability to exploit those nodes that were discovered by the intelligence people rapidly in order to try and degrade the terrorist activity that um, nations were faced with. And back in two, 2013, well, from the era of 2000 to 2013, remarkable disclosures about the ability to listen in on cell phone devices, the ability to spoof um, text messages from commanders led to some rapid degrading of the insurgent cells and the bomb makers during that particular time. And you can see some of the different programs that were in operation. Interestingly enough, the NSA also allowed um, the DEA and other American law enforcement agencies access to some of these capabilities when going after narcotics cartels as well. And in fact, enlisted the U.S. Navy in a um, intelligence role by listening to the various narcotics trafficking uh, talk that was going on on cell phones. So again, w the nation state capabilities that we were revealed to us from Snowden set the stage for essentially what became a whole bunch of different capabilities that we see today. When you looked at the Mueller indictment, many of you know what the Mueller indictment is. It is the indictment of whether or not the Russians interfered with the um, U.S. election. You saw a number of very interesting pictures taken of various Russian operators that all looked like they came from the webcam of their laptops. So we know for a fact that um, under the right circumstances, the United States capability to get into adversarial nation state devices does exist and they can use it to um, feed the necessary information into the um, into uh, the law enforcement. And then finally down at the bottom, and I think this is the kind of thing that becomes really interesting from again revelations in Snowden, the extraordinary capabilities uh, that were developed by the NSA TAO. You may know them as well um, as uh, uh, the equation group, I think is what we call them, um, in various Kaspersky documents. And Kaspersky and the NSA have not had a particularly good relationship, um, <laughs> to say the very least. Um, do you have some thoughts about sort of the move to cyber? Well, yes. Um, I, I don't want to bring in a bit about Snowden and why he was so damaging. Um, the intelligence business is nothing new. You know, it's described as the second oldest profession. We'll not discuss what the oldest is. Um, uh, and Hint, it's, it's not it's, cyber. It's, 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 been the, it's been there forever. The methods of gathering intelligence, whether it be using human sources, whether it be using um, electronic sources, whether it be using... There, there's only finite numbers of ways of doing things. There's only finite numbers of ways of being able to get into... Um, a mobile phone to uh, get into the signal that's on there to be able to deal with people. So if any techniques are exposed, it uh, uh, compromises different sources of that intelligence. It can take months, if not years, to get back into it again, and you lose your total feed. Um, and therefore, that's why there's so much classification around what people are doing. There's not a huge number of different techniques. Um, uh, and they're not new. Um, the first ever nation state deliberate denial of service attack in a conflict environment. Uh, I'll, I'll very quickly go around and I'm going to count back from the 1990s. It wasn't after that. Um, and kind of a very quick show of hands of people who think which decade it's in. So I'm going to go back uh, 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, 50s, 40s. 30s, 20s, 10, 0, 10. You're right. 5th of August, 1914. Whenever the um, uh, cable ship Alert set sail from Dover Harbor, went into the center of the channel, um, and um, in, um, uh, yep, the telecom cable. Yeah, and <laughs> snipped four telecom cables that were carrying. Uh, the, uh, t the telegraph communications to the rest of the world from continental Europe. It was the first aggressive act by the British of the First World War. Um, and uh, it resulted in the fifth cable being left um, alone. The fifth cable just happened to go through the UK, and it just happened to be wiretapped. Um, and it also caused the German 
um, politicians uh, uh, to communicate with their embassies around the world over high-frequency radio communications, which we'd intercepted and we'd uh, broken their encryption on it. Um, what did that lead to? That led to the intercept of what was called the Zimmerman Telegram. The Zimmerman Telegram was uh, instrumental whenever it was exposed to the Americans in bringing the Americans into the First World War. That's why they came in. Deliberate denial of service attack to force uh, someone onto another means, which you have already compromised, um, to then use that compromised material for an effect. Um, none of this is new. We just have so many more methods of doing it. Uh, and that's the thing to uh, look at and, and, and to put it into perspective. Yeah, and, and this is, again, you know, rinse, repeat, in, and change um, and adapt to the technologies that are out there. You'll see that um, in order to get an effect, we went from teams on the ground to autonomous systems, uh, to uh, drones uh, with various capabilities that were put up for tracking individuals. But I want to kind of go a little bit more forward and talk about the 2013 Op Anon attack on Syria. And um, this was all OSINT driven um, at, at the periphery end of the annual pilgrimage to Las Vegas, uh, Nevada, um, during, well, the next couple of weeks. I think some of you are making the pilgrimage I talked to last night. But here's an example of using data that was open sourced in order to identify targets within the uh, Syrian government who were doing very naughty things to minority populations in the wake of the Arab Spring uh, riots uh, that um, went there. And I would say collectively, the anonymous organization felt that what the Syrian government was doing was pretty abhorrent. So we found a number of interesting devices, and um, anyone know what RTSP is? Anyone that's not Bushido Token, um, do you know what RTSP is? Real-time streaming protocol, otherwise known as QuickTime. So as you can see, on these particular devices, they had um, port 554 open, and there's a handy link to a blog by Trend Micro of how to exploit RTSP. <laughs> so kind of a, a great example of how um, the Syrian government was able to be infiltrated by anonymous operations. And in order to do this, um, one of the targeted and frequently targeted devices are printers. And the reason for that was to deny the ability to have printed orders and force, as, uh, as my colleague Phil talked about, the same tactic of using uh, radio and or fiber networks that had already been compromised. So as you can see from the past hundred years, uh, we're using the same techniques, only modified uh, considerably. So I want to now sort of, now that we've set this stage in the introduction to what we're actually going to be talking about, we are now end up in the situation in 2014 where the Ukraine was invaded and NATO was not necessarily passive about it. However, uh, they realized very quickly that they would need to help and support. At this particular time, the fear of a global Russian cyber war was quite on the minds of everyone as a, as a result of not Petya and WannaCry attacks, um, which really rattled and concerned a lot of organizations, along with the ongoing attacks that nation states were faced when it came to national critical infrastructure. So um, an, uh, I would say a advisory and warning group was stood up looking at the Ukraine back in 2014, which became quite the cyber battlefield uh, in terms of understanding how uh, networks would be attacked in time of war and what could be done in order to defend those networks. And so I think we'll go to you now to talk a little bit about how a big part of this was the disinformation that spewed out of Russia. Well, as I said earlier, you know, disinformation is a critical part of everything that um, the Russians do. The Russians actually have a doctrine um, um, called Maskarovka, which is all about masking. Uh, perfect example of uh, Maskarovka, um, the Sergei Skripal attack in Salisbury, um, whenever um, Theresa May stood up in Parliament and said, it were the Russians, Gov, um, Vlad the man, we're calling you out. Um, Vladimir Putin turned around and said, no, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't me. It must have escaped from 
Porton Down, um, the British chemical warfare establishment just on the outskirts of Salisbury, um, and he wanted people to believe it. Um, the leader of the opposition then stood up in Parliament and said, yes, we uh, have to be completely certain it was the Russians behind this. It could have come from somewhere else, didn't quite cite what uh, Vladimir had said. Um, uh, and all of a sudden that started a debate. Vladimir Putin was sitting in Moscow behind his big oak desk with uh, a that big tumbler, super long desk, big the super long desk with a big tumbler of vodka over ice in the best Russian crystal, with a white cat on his knee, going, "Yes, they're <laughs> doing exactly what I want." He just wanted people to be putting alternative views out and not pointing the finger directly at, at Putin the whole way through. They've got a doctrine of that, and everything that they do um, is is focused around it. Um, and therefore, you have to take all messaging with a pinch of salt. Um, and understand where it's coming from and understand that people are trying to influence you. And yes, they can influence you and the Russians are good at it. I'll go back to the US elections. Um, did, did the Russians interfere with US elections? Hell yes. Did the Russians interfere with uh, the Brexit referendum? Hell yes. Did the Russians interfere with um, some other European elections? Hell yes. Um, you, you go onto my website and look at hacking your serotonin. There is very good research out there, a good academic research that's put into a practical application about how you can change the way people think over a period of time by taking that big data that's out there, by analyzing the big data that's associated with an individual, but also with all of the individuals that are linked to the, that individual, work out what they like, what they don't like, reinforce certain views and undermine other views by targeted messaging and targeted feeds that come up onto social media. And you know what social media people are using because it's because it's in there. The open source intelligence tools that exist out there at the moment. I got briefed on one last week that blew my mind. I could put on that open source intelligence tool a geographic circle around this building and watch every single social media output from any device of anyone that's inside this building um, going up and being, being posted online, uh, and it's targeting it. And I can do that legally. A lot of the nation states that are out there don't care about what's legal and what's illegal whenever it comes to looking at what's going on and, and getting into the big data, and they'll use that to manipulate. Um, and we're seeing that across the board, um, uh, both from the nation state effect, but then you get the blurring between the nation state and the serious and organized crime. Um, and the Russian oligarchs, the Russian oligarch system, um, it, it only works because they control different aspects of the Russian economy. Um, and they're only allowed to do that because they've got a political uh, master sitting over them um, who controls them. And they look after his money and he looks after their money. And you've got that symbiotic relationship. Um, and they control all the criminal groups. So whenever we hear of different APTs operating out of Russia uh, uh, that are um, serious and organized crime, well, they're paying their dues into the appropriate oligarch who's paying their dues into the political system that are taking the tasking and being allowed to get on with what they want. They make their money. They're allowed to keep the money that they, they get, but they are part of the whole government and political system. They, they just want a boat ride, I think is what they want. To, they want to be able to do that. I'm on a boat. Um that's a great sort of high level view of where we ended up, but it became really interesting to see it playing out on the state of affairs that was revealed about Russian society. So 30 years, uh, since roughly the, 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 um, Russians decided to, uh, part from communism and embrace Western, at least brands and ideology has all been revealed to understand that this was the biggest giant smorgasbord of money that we've ever seen uh, pour out of not only the post-Soviet um, uh, uh, countries, but from Russia itself as graft took hold within the organization. And what we've seen is evidence of this in a number of different capacities, specifically around um, the sanctioning of a tremendous amount of Russian super rich and seizure of their property on a global scale uh, that has sort of, I think, really revealed to us that uh, Russia um, is completely a corrupt society and that it's almost impossible uh, to do and transact legitimate business. And I think the other final thing is that one of the I would say smoking guns, as it were, with the, um, with the, uh, the poisonings that happened, um, came as a result of an, a, a, um, a, a literally a Russian spy's, um, expense claim, uh, that put them, um, in the same place as the, uh, attacks occurred. 
<laughs> so, um, and, and I call them the, uh, the, the, the semi intelligence service of Russia, uh, because even though we get the huge headlines of, you know, Russians have infiltrated and stolen data and, you know, um, all of those kind of things, uh, to be fair, it's usually because something wasn't patched or somebody clicked on a link that they shouldn't have. <laughs> so, so it's, it, it, I think there is a mythology on the level of sophistication. There, there is. And you have to remember that part of the, the overall network is the human. You have to patch the human as much as you have to patch the network that's in there. And, you know, as Ian said, um, the Bell and Cat, who were brilliant in bringing out this exposure. Um, one of the things that they identified very quickly was that all of the GRU officers um, not only were getting their passports with sequential numbers at, at different times, but um, a vast majority of them had registered their cars at GRU headquarters. Why they registered their cars at GRU headquarters? Well, it's because whenever they got stopped for speeding or drink driving or anything else, and the Russian policeman tapped into his computer and looked at the address of where the car was registered, went, oh, no. Shit, there's no way am I going to be able to do anything with this. I would let them go away. So for corruption inside the country, it compromised their intelligence agencies. All right, so we're going to fast forward. Um, and what NATO found was um, putting soldiers on the ground in hostile countries uh, is a very expensive endeavor to do the sorts of things to find the bad guys. So in the past, I would say, 25 years plus, uh, NATO has heavily invested in something called ISR. Okay. And you want to sort of break down what ISR is? I think we've got a slide coming up, but I'll just quickly mention that these are all the different platforms that are NATO. You've got Rivet joined from the UK down in the lower uh, left corner. You have uh, EA uh, 18 Prowler, uh, a replacement for the Grumman um, platform. But interestingly enough, and then you've got the new version, which that's um, an artist's rendering because the actual device is so classified, there's no pictures of it available publicly, of the KH-11 spy satellites that are up there. If he had said KH-11 20 years ago, um, in this public environment, he'd have been um, locked away. Yeah. It was still classified top secret. Yeah. And, you know, Aviation Weekly notwithstanding, right? Um so there is an interesting thing that I came across in doing the research for this. And you can imagine what I put it painting on the side of your EA6 growler with uh, a dude with a lightning bolt through him. And um, the open source intelligence on that is means that that airframe was involved in the direct, um, shall we say, suppression slash elimination of a target that was talking on a cell phone. So that when the um, 6 EA... 18 growlers were sent to Poland, probably stuck a really big cord with those kind of overt capabilities that they're now on public display about what that air pl airframe platform can accomplish. And we now look at the battlefield space from an electronics emissions. So on the um, right hand side was an amazing open source intelligence project, which I am confident. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, left hand side. I am confident that um, this data was taken directly from cell phone providers, but that's every Russian cell phone uh, that was on the Ukrainian 3G network um, put onto a map. Now, if we can do this in the open source world, I am pretty certain that it can be done far more granularly and far more accurately to then produce what we're seeing here, which is an electronic version of where the bad guy's at. You want to talk about that? And, and yes, you can look at the nodes again. Go back to the nodal analysis. You can see where the communications are coming from, uh, the centers that going out to different places. And that will then give you the headquarters. It'll give you the commanders. It'll give you the location that's there. And if you've got uh, something that can um, uh, have an effect on that location, uh, military speak for uh, blow it to pieces, um, uh, then you can use it. Um, the, the pictures of the platforms that are up there, you bring all of the intelligences together. ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance for target acquisition purposes. So sometimes it's called I-STAR. Um, and cool. you've got space-based, non-air breathing. You've got air breathing, so they fly in the air. Um, and you've got um, uh, subsurface, 
submarines, uh, etc. Uh, and you've got ground-based systems that are there. NATO has no ground-based systems that it'll admit um, uh, because NATO hasn't deployed any into Ukraine. Certain nation states may do. Um, air systems are flying on a daily basis the whole way around the outside of the Ukrainian border, um, north, south, uh, east, and w- uh, sorry, not north, um, uh, west and south um, and are feeding the intelligence that they're getting to give these sorts of pictures into the Ukrainians. So they've got a good idea of exactly where all the Russian commanders are. Um, and uh, they'll do everything from intercepting the signals communications, looking at radars, because a radar is associated with a weapon system, uh, through to what's called measurement and signature intelligence, which is fantastic. I can tell you if a vehicle's been in a position 24 hours ago and where it's moved to, and whether that vehicle was a, was a wheeled vehicle or a tracked vehicle, um, using uh, certain techniques with measurement uh, and signature intelligence, and you bring together all of these assets at all different levels to give you that wider intelligence picture, and take what you've got on the left, which is really comprehensive, and actually put an awful lot of color on it, and you might actually be able to identify by name who some of the individuals are. That's correct. And so this, folks, is the big data software piece that we we're talking about in terms of trying to get to the right-hand output, our I'm going to say this hand's output, which is a clear picture of where important assets are on the battle space, which then goes into a planning uh, phase. And I just want to mention the fact that it is highly likely that the cyber capabilities um, of Western nations, along with the Ukrainians, are being used to aid the accuracy of that of gathering that particular data. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I just want to quickly contextualize Russia right now, um, and Phil will run down pr- fairly quickly here on um, kind of if anyone is still Facebook friending Russia. Anyone still Facebook friending Russia? Well, <laughs> um, we've got we've got fence sitters, so they haven't blocked Russia in what's going on. Um, and we saw that in the United Nations vote. But uh, if we're looking at it in particular, the main countries that um, are sitting on the fence, we've got China, we've got India, we've got Pakistan. Whoever thought India and Pakistan would be political bedfellows in something. Um, and we've got Iran and a number of other, your North Korea, a number of other small countries. Why are they sitting on the fence? Um, they're sitting on the fence because they can see opportunities, A, to look after uh, their own economic needs by getting cheap grain, cheap oil, cheap uh, cooking oil and uh, other bits and pieces out of Russia. China's sitting there going, we can be the broker for this because we can make money from it. On, oh, oh, by the way, we can buy Russia, buy Russian natural resources um, uh, and all the rest of it because the, the war will finish and China plans 25 years ahead. Um, uh, they've done that through most of Africa. Um, and... Uh, They'll be sitting there watching their own little territorial ambitions around the world and whether there's an opportunity for them to go and exploit those. The thing that has stopped China going into Taiwan is Xi Jinping looked at the economic sanctions that were brought in against Russia very, very quickly indeed and went, we can't afford that against China and Chinese business. And therefore, um, oh, General, please take that plan to go and invade Taiwan that I told you to take off the shelf and put it back on again and sprinkle some dust over it just in case their ISR assets can see that we'd moved it. Yeah, 100% that. Um, So... To just kind of give you the quick rundown of the space that we're working in, from the Russian perspective, um, they're outclassed in a number of ways, especially on the intelligence side. Uh, you can consider that the entire network of the Ukraine's um, 3G and used to be 4G uh, has uh, been compromised from a Russian perspective. So that led to some startling capabilities that um, NATO has been assisting Ukraine with uh, and that is uh, this, which is the capabilities of taking NATO's doctrine and capability and marrying that up to a contemporary warfare environment like we really haven't seen before. Um, and I think probably to sort of like, um, to sort of put some uh, uh, perspective on this, I'll let Phil sort of talk about what the joint ISR pro- process is and why that became such a powerful tool. And I want to draw your attention to the lady soldier down in the corner uh, holding uh, a cell phone uh, where they have um, 1-800-SPOT-RUSSIA, uh, um, where you can call in if you see a Russian um, military vehicle or Russian troops. So go ahead. 
Yeah, they, the diagrams set themselves effectively. They're they're almost the same thing. You know, the intelligence cycle is what I use. Direct, say what you want. That's the hardest bit. Asking the question. You know, what what is the question that you want answered? Uh, and remember, intelligence is all about um, gathering information that you don't know. So using Donald Rumsfeld, you have to know what you don't know and then go out and find it. Um, uh, and, and then filling those gaps in to allow you to make decisions. So direct your collection assets, collect what the information that you need, process that information together and see if it answers the question and give it out to the people who are going to do something about it. Um, the, uh, in many cases, those that are going to do something about it could be go and collect more information. So you tell your, your um, ISR processes what you want them to go and pick up. And this is where you're telling individual sensing platforms to do stuff. So I want you to go and hoover up um, the uh, mobile phone data from there. I want you to look for this particular number or this particular um, IMEI um, number registering on that particular uh, cell tower. You're getting into the granularity. Or you could be directing um, people on the ground, um, something that the Ukrainians have got. They're running a lot of SOE-type operations. Yeah. Um, so someone who's still behind... Uh, in uh, enemy lines, they're still in the Donbass region, but they're they're Ukrainians and they're loyal to uh, the Ukrainian government to go and see where different commanders are. Do they go to that coffee shop that we think they're in um, at seven o'clock every morning? Answer: Yes, we're going to hit that coffee shop, but we're going to hit the coffee shop with uh, either a sniper rifle or an improvised explosive device or something else. And, and therefore, it's all a cycle, uh, and it's a continuous cycle that goes the whole way around. Um, achieving that list of high-value targets and high-priority targets and the effects that you want to deal with them. On many cases, it's to take out the target. In lots of other cases, it's actually to confirm that the target is there um, and they could be very valuable and you're listening in and you say, do not take out that target because they're giving us too much valuable information. Yeah, and in the words of Borat, tremendous success. Uh, as we approach the elimination of various leadership, including the highest ranked, uh, Russian general who was wounded, um, and narrowly escaped from his life with his life when the Ukraine hit a headquarters, it's highly likely that they would have known that he was operating in the region. We've seen, uh, the results of the attack on the Moscow, which was the flagship of the, uh, Russian fleet. Uh, we saw the tremendous um, ability of one intelligence analyst on the ground. He was actually a combat engineer who said, this looks like a really great place to cross a river. Really want you to listen if you hear any boat engines. Gets the report, I hear boat engines. Roger that. And they were able to deploy and um, really uh, mess up the Russians' attempts to do a uh, river crossing in daylight, which is never a good idea. Um, and usually ends in tears. And I think one of the biggest things uh, that came out of this was the revelations that the Germans and other allied nations were monitoring Russian soldier communications and could identify um, folks that gave the orders for various massacres that occurred uh, in the area for follow-up war crimes tribunals when, when this all becomes. So it was a digital war that had a giant sort of kinetic component and I, we're getting towards the end of this to say, has war fundamentally changed because of the introductions of these new technologies, the SOE type of operations, which is that gentleman, his identity is cloaked, the ability to build complex weapon systems at home, such as the Neptune mi missile you see there, and handheld drones being used to extend the ability and reach and visibility of um, just the standard soldier that's sitting out there. Phil, your thoughts? Um, the numbers of different ways of having that, those effects on the battle space uh, and, and forming on those effects has grown enormously. Um, but I'll, I'll come back and, and simplify it a little bit more and because we're talking cyber in many cases here. And a question that I get asked frequently was, why has cyber not had a greater effect um, on what's going on in, inside Ukraine? Um, and it's twofold. The first one is Ukraine has been preparing um, and fighting a cyber battle with Russia since 2014, in fact, before 2014. So they're well prepared for it. They've got the defenses in place. They know how to make sure that the networks are protected. And um, the rest of the world is helping Ukraine in doing that. Um, so this is nothing new. The second and the most important uh, effect is this is a kinetic war. You cannot cyber intercept a 152 millimeter high explosive shell or 7.62 millimeter short bullet, or it has no effect on a 40 year old um, uh, 
a jet aircraft that is dropping dumb bombs. Um, there's no cyber component that you can interfere with on that. Uh, and that's what's going on on the ground. And that's what's having the, the horrific effect. And that's what's unfortunately killing people. Yeah, and sort of to put an echo on that is that the cyber war that we thought was going to happen didn't, but the innovations of a nation that is known for having talented programmers and being able to uh, build applications rapidly created an app space for the Ukrainian soldier, and it went high level that accelerated their capabilities of using the resources that they have and applying them to the targets that they found. This was actually the ability of big data, GIS, um, as well as talented programmers within the Ukraine building applications for the military uh, to enhance its capabilities. So th think about that when you get the near constant um, Ukrainian uh, and uh, develop outsource um, uh, messages on LinkedIn, is that these are some very talented and capable people. So do you want to just sort of close a little bit on your view of sort of the app space for modern warfare? Well, I, th I think it's more than modern warfare. It's, it's, it's modern society. Um, and we have to realize that you know, from an intelligence perspective, um, you know, intelligence, information warfare, and all the rest of it used to be fixated on the battle space. And we're seeing that inside Ukraine. We're also seeing it spilling out of Ukraine elsewhere. And all of us our targets. Academia is a big target for nation state attacks, especially where there's research going on into the use of these sorts of areas. Uh, and uh, that means that individuals in academia who may be connected through their first level connection or second level connection to key people that are working on that are potential targets if it's a route to get into things. Uh, and one of the biggest threat vectors, I think, at the moment is um, through our smart devices. And it's through the apps on our smart devices. Um, and it's understanding you know, what's behind the apps. How many people download an app and actually read through the terms and conditions or just click go on it? If I asked people to put their hands in the air here um, uh, as to how many people got TikTok <laughs> on their devices, um, and uh, then I had another couple of hours and could explain just how compromised TikTok is, and that means that every single thing that you put through your device is being fed off to an intelligence agency. Um, all of your photographs all of your emails, all of your contacts, um, every single thing that is processed on that device is going off to an intelligence agency. Um, the same thing uh, when Pokemon Go hit the ground. Pokemon Go, and I was a sad individual who did read through the terms and conditions. Um, and if you look at it, it was developed by an individual um, uh, who set up a company that was partially funded by a front company of the CIA. And that was what was overtly available. What concerned me in the terms and conditions and the data privacy side of things was um, it clearly said what it would take off your device, and it was literally everything. Anything that was on there, any data source, um, whether your, your emails, your uh, contacts, your SMS messages, anything, it, it give, you give permission to access that. And it also had a little line in there saying that all of this data would be transmitted uh, back to servers in continental United States. Question, why? Well, that allowed certain legislation to come into play for the United States to legally then intercept and uh, use that data. Um, apps, that's the biggest threat, I think, at the moment. So whenever you get into the future life app development or uh, protecting um, the way apps are done, um, uh, look at it very carefully indeed. Uh, fascinating areas. And my sort of last thought on this uh, is that in the Ukraine war, application, web application security is a matter of life and death. Thanks, guys. I, th I think we've got time for a couple of questions, if there, if there are any. Yep. Oh, we've got one, one here. Uh, thanks for that. That was fantastic. Um, just one of the things I'm trying to read into that. Are you almost suggesting that Russia's technical capability is likely to be something that really hurts it in future? That technical capability is something that really hurts in the, in the future? It will hurt Russia as this goes on. Are you, it's almost like you're suggesting they're a lot less technically advanced 
or is it just we're yep. not seeing um, that? The, that the, level the, of the, the biggest thing from a technological perspective that's hurting Russia's ability to prosecute the war is their lack of access to high tech, the chips that they need for the smart weapons, to be able to replace their arsenals um, and everything else that's getting damaged. Military kit is very complex and breaks frequently. If you can't get the spare parts for it, the, and, and they can't get the spare parts for it, that's why the sanctions are really important, as well as the effect that they'll have on the oligarchs and pressure and everything else. And they, they've resorted to stealing uh, uh, steel to repair their, their vehicles and infrastructure because they can't get it domestically. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, folks, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Thanks, guys.